Okay, so the difference between vectors and scalars is that vectors have direction and magnitude, and scalars is just a, a simple quantity. Okay, so when you do the dot product, what happens is you take two vectors and you do the dot product on them, and it produces a scalar. Okay, but when you do the cross product, um, that actually produces a vector. It produces a vector that is perpendicular to the two vectors that you cross product. Okay, so you can't do a dot product and then try to cross that with something because you can only cross two vectors, and so you can't cross a scalar and a vector. Okay, uh, you can multiply a scalar times vector, but you can't cross them. Right? And so let's look at the uh, parallelogram rule. So. Some people will see this in different ways, but if you have, um, let's say, a vector v, and I'm going to change it from my nodes. I'm going to call this vector w. Okay. So let's say we wanted to add these two vectors together. Okay. So v plus w. Well, then all you're going to do is draw a parallelogram. Unit circle. And 
it, it's the angle from the x-axis. And so, how does this break down into what I was just talking to about direction and magnitude? This quantity right here is the magnitude. And this vector right here is the direction. Okay. So this is just in uh, two dimensions. When you start getting into higher dimensions, um, the quantities will represent the distance from the x-axis, the distance from the y-axis, and the distance from the z-axis. All right. Now let's say let's look at this right here. So we have magnitude and direction, and so let's try to figure out what if I was adding two vectors with different magnitudes and different directions. Instead of drawing pictures like I was doing above, that's relatively easy. I mean, you just draw a parallelogram. It's not that big of a deal. How do you actually quantify that um, the addition? Okay, using these types of directions and magnitudes. Right? So let's say we have two forces acting in different directions. There's a lot of problems in y'all's book that there's a plane headed northwest, northwest in this direction with a crosswind headed uh, southeast in an opposite direction with a certain amount of force. And the plane has a certain amount of uh, its velocity uh, of how fast it's going. And then you ask the question, well, if the plane's moving this way, you got a crosswind going this way, what is the actual travel path of the plane? He's trying to fly that way, but the force of the wind is pushing him in a different way. So how would we actually add those two vectors together and figure out the actual uh, motion of the plane? Or, I mean, uh, there are other problems involving uh, tensions of cords, where you have a weight that's pulling on two cords, and you try to figure out what the tension is of the combined forces of those cords. So let's just take two different forces and see if we can add those together and figure out the correct direction and magnitude of the problem. Okay. So, I picked a relatively simple one, just for, uh, simple, uh, for simplicity. Okay, so <clears throat> let's say we have 300 newtons of force acting in this direction. Okay, and now we have this. Okay, and then let's say we have 200 newtons of force acting in this direction. And the angle right here is going to be 60 degrees. Okay. And so <clears throat> let's find the magnitude So we have one force acting solely in the negative x direction, uh, and then we have another force that is acting at an angle up into the first quadrant. And we want to figure out, if we added these two forces together, what the, res the resulting force would be. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to, and honestly, I don't really like using degrees, but I'm kind of following along with Gail's book. So uh, it goes into degrees. I guess a lot of pilots and other engineers would lean themselves more towards degrees, whereas as a mathematician, I, I, I'm naturally impartial to radians, but we'll, we'll go with degrees for right now. 
Okay. Okay. So uh, let's look at the combination of these two forces. So let's look at um, the one at a weird angle first. It's not a weird angle, it's 60 degrees. So <clears throat> the first guy, and I'm going to use I's and J's. So this would be now 200 cosine of 60 times I plus on 200 times sine of 60J. Okay. So now this is the force acting in this direction. So you see on the, uh, the previous problem, I wrote it as Cosine theta, sine theta. So I'm multiplying the magnitude of the force times cosine and magnitude of the force times sine. I'm just writing it in a slightly different format using i's and j's. Okay. So that's one of our forces right there. Now we have to consider the force acting in this direction right here. Okay. So we have 300 newtons. And since I'm doing this in degrees, let's keep on doing it in degrees. So this would be up to 90 degrees. That would be up to 180 degrees. Okay? Okay. So we're going to add these two guys together. And so that's going to be plus, now, 300 times cosine of 180 degrees multiplied by I plus 300 times sine of 180 degrees multiplied by J. Okay. So that, this right here is going to be the sum of our two forces and we are going to combine the I's and the J's and then from that we are going to try to figure out what the magnitude of the resulting force is and um, what the direction or the, uh, the angle of the resulting force will also be. Okay. So it's it's literally the magnitude, which is 200 for the first one, times cosine of the angle, sine of the angle, magnitude of the second one, times cosine of the other angle, and sine of the other angle. Okay. Now, sine of 180 degrees, that thing is flat right there. It's only going in the I direction, so this guy's going to be zero. Okay. Now, cosine of 180 degrees, remember, I always think this as cosine of pi, if I do a revolution of the uh, unit circle onto that one, what am I going to get? I'm going to get cosine of pi, which is negative 1. Right. Okay, now I'd also have to consider, you know what, I'll write this in two steps. So, let's consider cosine of 60 degrees. Okay, so remember, co uh, 30 degrees and 60 degrees is pi over 3 or pi over 6. <coughs> And so it's either 1 over 2 or root 3 over 2. Okay? Now, cosine of 60 degrees is steeper. Okay? So since it's steep, uh, steeper and we're talking about cosine, and cosine is corresponding to the base right here, well, root 3 over 2 is bigger than 1 over 2. So I'm going to pick the smaller one for that guy. So this whole thing is going to equal now 200 times 1 divided by 2i plus now 200 and then this guy is going to be root 3 divided by 2 now j okay okay so uh, that's cosine of 60 degrees and sine of 60 degrees okay where sine is the vertical spot when you're at 60 degrees the vertical spot is longer than the horizontal spot and then we have to consider this line right here Okay, so cosine of 180 degrees is negative 1. So this would be plus 300 multiplied by negative 1i and plus 300 times 0 j. Okay. So this term right here is just going to disappear. Let's say uh, root 3 divided by 2 multiplied by 200. We can simplify that out a little bit. And then 200 divided by 2 is going to be 100. So 
this guy right here is going to equal 100 minus 300i, and then just plus 100 times root 3j. So, this is going to become now negative 200 i, and then we'll just leave this one as plus 100 root 3j. Okay, so this is going to be the resulting vector of the addition of those two forces. Okay, so we got the resulting vector. Now that we have the resulting vector, we need to consider its magnitude and direction. Okay? Alright. So the magnitude is going to equal the square root of negative 200 squared plus now 100 root 3 squared. <clears throat> okay, so let's think about how we can simplify this process. So <clears throat> if somebody has, uh, I mean, all right, so this is really what, negative 2 times 100, and then it has to be squared, okay? Well, that's going to be 100 squared times 3. So uh, if I pull 100 out of both of them, I can rewrite this as 100 times the square root of 4 plus 3. Okay. And so that's going to equal... One hundred root seven newtons. That's the magnitude of the force acting upon. So, <clears throat> all right. Now let's try to figure out. Okay, so we have the magnitude one hundred root seven. <clears throat> um, now we have to consider how am I going to figure out the angle of this thing? Okay. So I've got. I mean, this is a magnitude times sine theta. This is a magnitude times cosine theta. Now, if I divide these two by each other, the magnitudes are going to cancel out. Okay? And so, and, and also, if I divide them uh, by each other, what am I going to end up with? It's going to be sine theta divided by cosine theta. Okay? So what is sine theta divided by cosine theta? Well, that's tangent theta. Okay? So if I divide these two guys together and say, well, theta equals tangent inverse of these two, that's going to give me a, two possibilities, okay? So, I've got my 100 root 3, that's going to be my magnitude times sine theta, and I have my two, negative 200, that's going to be my magnitude times cosine theta. So let's divide those guys together. So, <coughs> there, would equal tangent inverse of 100 root 3 divided by negative 200. Okay, well, the hundreds will cancel out. That's why I mean by the magnitudes canceling out. That's going to equal tangent inverse of, let's just write this as negative root 3 divided by 2. Now, um, if you don't have a graphing calculator, like, I don't own a graphing calculator, I don't know why, but I would never have. Um, I did, uh, last night I just plugged it into Wolfram. But Wolfram gave me an answer that I didn't like, okay? So, what did Wolfram tell me? It said, well, this is going to equal negative
that's the answer it's put out. But if we look at our forces, that doesn't make any sense. So mode negative 40.89b could be somewhere in that region right there. Okay? That's incorrect. Okay? But we have another option. If you add 180 degrees to it, what are we going to get? We're going to get it pointed in that direction right there, which is really the correct one. Okay? So if I add 180 degrees to it, that's actually going to give me the real result, the answer, which is 139.1 degrees. So you do have to look back at the picture that you're actually looking at to figure out what your angle actually is. Okay, so it has to be pointed in this direction corresponding to the parallelogram that you drew. Now, why does this uh, type of property happen whenever you're doing tangent inverse? Uh, the reason is, if you're saying tangent inverse of negative root 3 over 2. Now, it does not know if sine is negative or if cosine is negative. Okay? The same thing can happen in the positive region. So if you have uh, you know, tangent inverse sine over cosine in a positive region, well, it can actually be reflected into this region as well because you would have a negative divided by a negative. In this case, you have a negative in the y direction divided by a positive in the x direction. And in this case, you have a positive in the y direction divided by a negative in the x direction. So that's where the discrepancy comes into play. But as long as you understand which quadrant you're in, then uh, if, you're, if, if something tells you the wrong quadrant, add 180 degrees to it, and it'll actually put you back in the correct quadrant. Okay? So that's actually how you add vectors and then try to find their direction and magnitude. Granted, some of these problems can get a lot more complicated. This one ended up being nice and kind of easy because I ended up with relatively nice numbers until I got to the angle. Well, and the magnitude, they both ended up being a little ugly, but um, it's not a bad problem.